more forward than their age. Some people carry a lot more on them than is appropriate, so to speak, for their age. Right? They age quicker than others. What we carry on the inside, what we think, what we feel, affects our body. And if it affects our body, it also affects how we interact with other people. Right? One of the concepts, so I just want to be conscious of time because I promised uh, that I'd be done by three, so. One of the concepts that is really powerful regarding happiness is that our emotion, right? If you think about it, actually, the word emotion comes from the word emotion. It means how we move affects our bodies. This is one of the reasons why exercise over the last 20 years has become so much more popular. 20 years ago, there weren't gyms on every street corner. Right? You had to drive to a gym. You couldn't walk to one close. Right? Our emotion is affected by motion. The way that we move, the way that we think, both of those things are totally controlled by us. You know, many times, we don't realize it, but we let the outside environment control it, right? The, the external stimuli. Rabbi Tats was talking the other day about mabat achitzoni, which is basically taking all the external senses and the processing, the way that we think about things, and the sight, smell, touch, sound, taste, five senses, how we process external information. And he said that the Western culture, which is really what's going on now, there's this rebirth of information. Western culture does not have mabat pinimi, this intuitive, this internal, being able to just focus within, being able to think about what's going on inside. Right? And that is what happiness researchers, what psychology is teaching us now, that when you're able to tune in and able to tune out all of the noise, that's when people start to feel the happiest. That's when they get the best rest. And they found that people who are happier, not only do they perform better, they earn more, they have more energy, and they have more fulfillment. So even though happiness is a little bit different than fulfillment, they can actually get more through feeling happy. Right? When it comes to the language part, when it comes to thinking about language, now hold on. I want to use a, an example. The, one of the first clients I had years ago was a young man who had moved to a new state. And he said that he had friends that lived in this new state. And he moved there because his friends told him he had new opportunities. And his friends told him, hey, listen, you guys come with your wife and kids, move here. And when you move here, you'll feel, you know, you'll feel like you're one of us. We'll introduce you to our friends. We'll show you around town. <coughs> we'll introduce you to all the hot spots of where to go. With, we'll include you with our community. And so he picked up his family, picked up his friends. He switched jobs. He moved to that new state. And he said, when we moved there, it was so painful because every single one of the things they said they would do for us, they didn't do. Not only were we not even in touch with them, I'm so hurt. How could they say that? How could they say that they would help us, they would be there for us, they would help us adjust and introduce us to a new group of friends, and they didn't do anything. And as I'm listening to this, I asked him one question. I said, you're right. You're totally right. Maybe they wronged you, maybe they promised this. Right, but thinking about the, the life conditions and blueprint, right? How life was and what he expected to happen. So I asked him one question. I said, you can be right. You are right about this. You have a decision, right? Because moving forward, you can either be right or you can be happy. Which one would you choose? Do you want to be right or do you want to be happy? Now, how many of us have times in our lives where something happens in a relationship where we want something. Someone promises us something. We trust that they will actually deliver on their promise. Right? That's a little bit vulnerable to do. And then they don't do it. Even though they promised us they would be relying, we're depending upon them to do it. And they don't do it. And you're right. But they didn't deliver on their promise. And we feel it inside. If you were to ask yourself, do I want to be right or do I want to be happy? Which one do you think would deliver more happiness? Is it being right? No. Right. So, it happens to be he, this guy is now adjusted to his community. So there's a happy end of the story. But in the process, it's so easy to get focused, to, to focus on the small thing, right? On what isn't going right. And finding the problem, noticing the problem more and more, that he just noticed more and more in how he wasn't happy. Right? And when you notice more and more what wasn't going right, 
then he wasn't able to enjoy. So this brings me back to the, the high five exercise. The high five exercise is my nickname for basically every morning what I do. And this started because when I started davening in the morning, thinking about this concept, I realized that as I make just the brachas in the morning, right, I realized, oh my gosh, there's a bracha here for all the things that I do have that I could just as easily not have. So I'll give you an example. I have a running joke with my wife, right? If you ever notice on, you get a package in, in the mail or you buy something, and on the box it has a warning sign. Right? We recently got a, a stroller, and on the stroller it had a warning sign. And it said, this is not for amusement rides. And I thought, what had to happen for them to have to put that on the box, <laughs> right? We got a microwave. Right, some of you might have heard this crazy story, apparently it's true. This is not a warming device for pets. <laughs> Warning. What had to happen? Can you like see the video of like what had to happen for them to need to put that on there? Right? So <laughs> sometimes the question that I ask is what has to happen for us to recognize what is going right? Sometimes it's not having it. Right? So when I, when I was focusing on this, thinking about this exercise, this gratitude exercise, I realized when it says pokeach ivrim, shlosani oven, shlosani guy, shlosani isha, pokeach ivrim, each one of these things, I think about, okay, what would life be like if I did, if I was that, if I was an evet, right? How would my life be different if I was a wife instead of a husband? Would that be easier or harder for me? What if I was not Jewish? What if I was blind, God forbid? Interesting. Wow. And then I start to notice all the things around me that I can only see because I'm not blind. Here's the next one. This is my favorite. Mabish Arumu. And I realized I have suits, ties, shirts, outfits, pants, socks. I have a whole different wardrobe where there's dozens of combinations of outfits that I have. When I wake up in the morning, they're all waiting for me, like a king. I have dozens of different outfits I could be wearing. Oh my gosh. My grandparents, my great-grandparents barely had more than five sets of clothing. I live like a king from a hundred years ago. Not only do I have clothes, I have so many different options. Wow. And, and the fact that I could just, it, it, it's right there. I could change and I could have Atira I used to work in a hospital. In the hospital, Almost every single patient that I visited was not able to move. Whether it was a finger, an arm, a leg, or a head. And I realized all the people that can't move, when I start going like this, right? How much effort does it take me to move? And then you see someone who can't, and you go, oh my gosh, I'm so glad that's not me. But you can also focus on what is you. That movement, that capability, what a shift. So kif kif ufim. Right, Rokah or it's online. Um, Hurricane Sandy. Anyone remember Hurricane Sandy? Yeah. Okay. Hurricane Sandy was the time when there was so much water on the streets that they couldn't get, you guys probably remember this, they couldn't get gas trucks, right, the gasoline trucks, to the gas stations. So there was gas shortage. So people actually ran out of gas waiting in line four blocks away at the gas station. You guys remember this? Yeah? It was one of those times where, in certain parts of New York, the water was so high that the, the stairs leading up to someone's house were invisible, right? So I had a friend who said to me, he said, you know, when I woke up that morning and I realized that I couldn't get the kids out of the house, and when I called the EMS, when I called the ambulance services to help us evacuate, they're like, we're not sending a truck to you. I'm sorry, you're on your own, buddy. He was like, oh my gosh. Rokaha Aretz al Just to keep the water off of the land, what a blessing. I never thought about that. But yet you find something so simple. And what had to happen for him to appreciate it? A hurricane. So sometimes I ask in my own life, okay, if something isn't going right, what has to happen for me to appreciate what is going right? Shift in focus, shift in experience, total change in my life. So, I want to share with you guys an exercise. So, but in order to do this exercise, I need you to do two things. I need you to just sit up in your chair, just lean back so your back's against your end of your chair. <coughs> I 
Now I want you to close your eyes. And take a deep breath in, and then keep your eyes closed. Okay. Take another deep breath in, your eyes closed. I want you to imagine. I want you to imagine that you're standing on the top of a skyscraper. Now, while you're there, I want you to look around the top of the skyscraper, and I want you to notice that there's no railing on the top of the skyscraper. And with your eyes still closed, I want you to notice that you're standing, you're up over 100 stories high, no railing. Now in your mind, I want you to look down and notice what shoes you're wearing. Now that you look past your shoes, and I want you to notice that the, what the material of the balcony is made of. What material is it? Could be, is it asphalt? Is it cement? Marble? Is it glass or wood? Is it tile? Could be anything. And as you look up again, your eyes still closed, notice what time of day is it? Is it daytime? Is it nighttime? Is it sunny or overcast? Is it cool up there? Warm up there? Do you feel the sun beating down on you? What sounds can you hear? Maybe the air conditioning unit? Do you hear the traffic? Do you hear the sound of the cars beeping? Maybe a helicopter? With birds? With the wind? Can you feel a breeze? Can you feel the sun? Can you feel some coolness on your face? And now remembering, still with your eyes closed, remembering that there's no railing at the edge. Walk to the edge of the balcony and put your feet right up against the edge. And when your feet are right up against the edge, I want you to just lean over just a little bit and look down. And notice how small everything is down there. And as you're looking down, notice what you're feeling in your body right now. And then either walk or crawl back to the middle of the balcony. And when you get back to the middle, I want you to open your eyes. Now, how many people noticed that when you did that, something happened in your body? For those of you still awake, let's see if you just woke up. How many people noticed when you did that, something happened in your body? Hey, what did you notice? Who wants to share? <coughs> Anyone in the back? Heart rate went up. What? Your heart rate went up. Heart rate went up. Anyone in the back want to share? No? High no pressure. That's what, that's, what, that's what happened to me too. My heart rate went up as I came up. close to the edge and then when I moved back, my, my whole body relaxed more. Okay, all right. Anyone else? Scared. What? Scared. You got scared. What did you feel in your body as you leaned over the edge? I'm hearing fear. Fear. Fear, tightness. Where was your tightness? My muscles. In your muscles. Anyone else had any other reactions? Kind of like a thrill. You had a thrill? Yeah. You had a thrill? Great. Okay. So a lot of times people say they had a knot in their stomach or their knees felt shaky. Yeah? Or maybe their heart dropped. Right? That was my reaction when I did this. So you see, you had physical reactions to a picture in your body. Physical response. Interesting. Your body was responding the way as if you were there, while it was just a picture in your own mind. So you see that psychology has actually taught us that our bodies cannot tell the difference between a real event and a vividly imagined event. Right? How your mind perceives an event or situation will determine the physical response in your body. 
Physiology is affected by focus. And you just experience it without leaving this room. So I want to close with something to focus on. Right? The concept of language we'll talk about. Now, let's try an experiment. Every one of you here, okay, I want you to just point to yourself. Point to yourself. Now I want you to just each keep keep by pointing to yourself. I want you to all look around the room and just notice where other people are pointing. So you want to point to yourself? No pressure. There you go, okay. Okay, now, now put your hands down. Now again, I want you to po point to yourself. Just point to yourself. Again. <laughs> okay. So most of you guys did the same thing each time. That was a little, that was like a little trick because a lot of people just follow what I do. Right? So when I did this, you guys changed it. But if you look around the room, we almost all focus, when we point ourselves, we focus right over here. Why? Why don't you ever see someone point to their head or their kneecap or their shoulder? Right? Interesting, because we see that there's something inside of us, the language, how we describe ourselves, is that we see ourselves, like ourselves are in our heart. Have you ever had someone say to you, imagine this, have you ever had someone say to you, I love you with my whole head? <laughs> or my whole stomach? Right? Why? Where, where does it come from that we see ourselves as our heart? Interesting. So part of this is understanding that when we see things, we see ourselves as our heart, that's also the seed of positive emotion. Fear, when you were experiencing that fear, were you in your heart just now when you were leaning over that skyscraper? Or were you thinking in your head, were you seeing this picture in your head and then feeling something in your heart as a result of what you were seeing in your head? Interesting. Fear, by the way, I teach my clients as an acronym for falsified experiences appearing real. We often stop ourselves from fear of something because in our minds we see a video of the worst case scenario playing out. And because we see that playing out, we stop ourselves because it appears so real. Fear, falsified experiences appearing real. So I'm going to summarize and we'll close with a story. So the first thing we spoke about is many of the things in our culture about happiness are things that teach us how actually to be unhappy. So you look at what a marketer says. Right? You look at what is being said, you get this, this will be really happy. The example of the medication right, that we spoke about on Thursday, right, the, the, the company, the whole experience of the prescribed medication is families together, and you see people hiking together, and you see, I see a lot of fresh faces, so I'm going to share with you. The, you see this, this family unit, the husband and wife, and they're going on a hike up the mountain, and it's gorgeous scenery, and it's beautiful skies, and beautiful weather, and he's laughing, and she's <laughs> laughing, and Connecting, and then all of a sudden you see all the, the kids and the grandkids running out, and they're giving them hugs and lifting them up. Right? It's like this incredible experience. <coughs> they're having a great time. And while you're watching this commercial, you're going, "What is this for? Aflac? Like, what is this? Geico? Like, is there a car about to crash somewhere? Right? And you have no idea what it's for. And then you see the next thing. They're all sitting down. And they're all smiling at the table, having a, you know a cookout on a Sunday night. You're like, "Okay, where do I buy some?" And then it comes on the screen. You know. Simulac, or whatever it is, right? I just see a lot of commercials for Simulac because I have anything. Right, but you see this like medication that has nothing to do with anything. And then they tell you all the things like, side effects might be death, dying, heart attack, loss of loved one, you're like, oh, it's probably worth it. Right? I'll buy three of them, what the heck. What they're selling you is an experience. They're selling you is the emotion that you want to feel. They're selling you what you think would be happy. Right, if I had this, I'll be happy. This if and then thinking, right? If I can't tell you how many people have said to me, if I only had more money, I'd be happy, right? When I'm successful at this, I'll be happy. I achieved all my goals, so I made new ones, right? So what they did was they had all the goals. They had, if this happens, and then it does, then I'll be happy, but they're still not happy. Why? Either because they keep moving the goalposts. Like there's, it's like this elusive thing, happiness, or because they never focus on what's going right. Focus, physiology, and feeling. I want to close with the final story. But the, the concept, if you take away gratitude, focusing on what is going right, seeing the good in your life right now will help you see more of the good. Just like when you buy a car, 
You'll see more of that card. So too with the good. Focusing on the solution instead of focusing on the problem will help you notice more solutions instead of noticing more problems. There's a family playing outside on a warm summer day. And they had just gotten this new little kitten. And as they're playing outside, this little kitten runs up a tree in the front yard and it gets stuck between two sharp branches. And it can't get out. And as they're trying to reach it, because of where it got stuck in the tree, they realize that it's too far and they just can't get it out. So the father comes over and he says, Don't worry, I'm on to the rescue! I know what we're going to do. I'm going to take my rope. I'm going to take my car. I'm going to tie the rope around the tree, tie the other end to the car. I'm going to get in my car, drive a little bit, lower the branches, and then we'll be able to maneuver around and get the kitten out. And they all say, Abba, to the rescue! So he takes his rope, and he ties around the tree. Ties it onto the back of the car. Gets in the car, and he drives a little bit slowly, slowly driving. Branches start to come down slowly, slowly. Driving slowly, slowly. Branches lowering, lowering. Drives a little bit. Branches lowering. And suddenly, rope snaps. And the tree flings in the opposite direction. And the kitten goes flying into the sky. And that's the end of the story. <laughs> but not all stories have happy endings, right? Two weeks later, the father's visiting one of the guys in his community. By the way, the father happened to also be a rabbi. He's visiting, visiting one, of the, one of the members in the community, and he says, and they greet him at the door, so nice to see you, how are you doing today? And they say, oh, thank you so much, Rabbi, please, please come in. He steps into the hallway, and he notices over there, standing in the hallway, is the little kid. And it was unmistakable. He knew that this was his little kid. See, he, he wasn't sure how to say this. But he wasn't going to say, like, is that my kitten? So instead he got a little bit more classy. He said, that's a nice little kitten you've got. Have you, that's a nice little kitten you've got. Have you had her long? And they said, Rabbi, you are not going to believe this. But it was two weeks ago, and I was in the garden with my son, and he and I were planting trees, and he said to me, Mommy, can we please have a kitten? And I said, listen, we decided many times, spoken about this on a number of occasions, we're not going to have a kitten. We're not, it's just not happening. And he said, but Mommy, I really want a kitten. And she said, okay, but, but we're not going to have a kitten. That's it. That's the end of it. But he kept pestering me. And the only thing I could think of was to say, okay, fine. You know what? If you really want a kitten, I'll tell you what. Let's stand together right here in Davin. And if Hashem wants to give you a kitten, he'll send you a kitten. <laughs> Rabbi, you are not going to believe this. <laughs> In that story, you see... There's another element to happiness. It's believing that in this moment something can be better than what it is. Because so often in life we get stuck between two sharp branches and we do not know how to get out. And then we think of something. And we, we have a strategy. But sometimes the rope snaps. And sometimes things go in the opposite direction of how we want them to go. Sometimes they actually fling back and we feel like we're actually even further back from where we want to be. And we have a decision. Are we going to focus on the opportunity? How are we going to describe the situation? How are we going to move forward from that? What are we going to take away from it? And there's a last element to prayer, right, is prayer, which is noticing that there's always a possibility of something better. And that we're never alone in wanting to improve our lives. And ultimately, you never know, but anything can happen. Thank you for coming. Thank you for listening.